Business 630, Corporate Finance, week number four. This is our lecture video. This is Professor Hassey, and today's date is Monday, February 21st. Happy President's Day. Our topic this week is cost of capital and capital budgeting. You have a case number two that's been posted this week talking about the cost of capital, and that leads us into our capital budgeting discussion. And we have a good template for capital budgeting posted in part of my lecture today and part of our weekend update lecture at the end of this week. But first, let's review case number one. The grades have been posted, all uh, very good work by all on uh, case number one. And I wanna just go over a, a couple, couple key parts of that and how it all works. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> Um, the, there's a rubric, which I have given each one of you, or a grade assessment uh, spreadsheet, and I've given all of you, and so let's take a look what that what that represents. Each student receives a, a risk assessment and evaluation sheet for all the cases, and this is the one for our case number one, which was the risk evaluation, and it's uh, five segments of the, of the work. Uh, uh, paper focus organization, did uh, did you stick to your abstract? Did you stick to the design of the case uh, and the, how you organized and displayed your work? That's the first part. The next was the risk evaluation, basically part one. Uh, did you locate the credit rating of your company? Did you calculate the capital asset pricing model uh, required rate of return correctly? Did you have your capital structure percentages of the company? Next was risk perspective, the organizational health, the environmental risk of the company. Uh, did you provide support or give uh, an additional interpretation to some of your thoughts on that? And your overall APA format and paper presentation. Uh, those all added together to produce uh, your grade for this, for this work. I've filled this out and given each one of you in your grade center the results of that and posted your grade to Blackboard. Now also, if you go to the uh, case number one file folder in Blackboard, you will see a sample of a solution file. And let's take a look at that right now. The solution file is, again, this is just a basic, uh, th this designates uh, A work. In other words, anywhere from a 95 to a 100, this is A work. And again, everybody has their own interpretation. You all had your own interpretations and I graded accordingly. But I wanted to give you a sample of what I consider A work. And a lot of you did A work to begin with, but just for some of us maybe who did not do A work, just to give you an idea of what uh, that represents in this case. First of all, the, uh, the, the title page should explain the nature of the case study, the class you're in, uh, your professor, and that sort of thing. And then uh, in, in many cases, or in may, most APA work, you have your table of contents, which just gives a brief uh, page description of where the information is included. An executive summary or abstract uh, uh, can be called either one where you highlight uh, and give an explanation of your work in this case, what you're trying to find out, what's going, whether the basic premises of your analysis, that's in the executive summary or abstract. Notice it's on a separate piece, a separate page. And then you go about going about your analysis. Now, I like to see uh, uh, tables used. I like to see graphs used. I like to see just not writing, but additional information highlighting this. And this is an example in this in this case where you know you show your credit rating, you show the uh, certain percentages and values that you had to find in that work. Naturally, all of your numbers would be different according to the type of company you selected, but something along these lines. And then when you go, but then you go about explaining and noting what this information tells you highlighted in the case analysis. And then you go about explaining the quantitative analysis of explaining different other risks involved in this company. The name of the company is AMC Entertainment, but just basically give details and give explanations of certain points of the environmental risk and the risk associated. A lot of you are uh, good to use SWOT analysis in some of this as a way of highlighting some risk of the company. It's your own interpretation, but notice the how the work is set up. Um, 
this is what I'm looking for. It's easy to read. I know where everything is. It's easy to access. And I can see the quality and the, and the quantity of your work. And then the work cited or reference page of, of, of notice. Of notice in this work, though, numerous works cited. It just wasn't one or two sources. Uh, th this shows me that the students spent a lot of time in researching and doing, putting a lot of effort into the case and giving the most complete answers provided. That is important to me as well. But generally, you can just get a feeling of that. Now, most of the errors in this work were in, had to do with the, the part one. Everybody did part two very well because that's mainly interpretation and I'm seeing how you interpret that information. But in part two, uh, part one, uh, I needed to see that explanation of, uh, of some of the key calculations. And some of us had the capital asset pricing model re uh, equation wrong. You use the market return instead of the market premium. That took some points off. Also, I couldn't follow directly many uh, presentations on what was the percent of debt to assets and what was the percent of equity assets. That was confusing in some of, in some of the information. I, I mentioned uh, nothing about doing weighted average cost of capital. That's in case number two this week. Some of you did include it and that was fine. But again, stick to the what the case is being asked, stick to the details of the case, answer as completely as possible and put it in a format that's easy to read, concise, uh, but for lack of a better word, not too much BS. You know, stick to the writing, stick to the points, and that's it. I don't need to see a lot of other additional data that's not being asked in the case. You do that, you'll do get a good grade on your work. So that's just a review of case number one. Case number two this week, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is is another APA format. No, please note the email I sent this weekend, where I've decided to change the calendar and and some of the aspects of the course over the next couple of weeks. Case number two is has been posted and is again, another APA format work. Okay, let's take a look at Blackboard where some of this information is heading into our fourth week. First of all, in, uh, in um, case study file folder, there is the case study number two. It's in two formats, a PDF and a Word doc, very similar uh, to the case number one and how I presented it to you. But it's uh, you're asking to do some calculations and again, some interpretations. Uh, and again, in APA format, it is due Sunday at midnight. Pretty short, this shouldn't take you too long. I cut back on a little bit. Uh, I'll get you later on in the course as far as uh, length of work, but that's case number two. In case number one, I posted that solution file uh, that I just went over in case any of you wanna see in the details or use it as a basis to do any other future APA format work in our class. Uh, there it is right there, okay? Also in week number four this week, if you go to the week number four file folder, there's our agenda. There's our introduction, uh, some definitions of the cost of capital, a nice spread PowerPoint defining that. Another definition of the cost of capital here uh, in this explanation. And just some additional uh, videos highlighting our discussion this week. Also, I will post uh, the spreadsheet that I'm about ready to show you in this. This will be in the introduction section. Uh, and also in the in-class review section that will be posted after this lecture, where you can download and look at the template I'm giving you about cost of capital and capital budget. Basically, the next two weeks are gonna be spent looking at this file that I'm about ready to show you. So there's some important points in our Blackboard file folder. Okay, here's the uh, meat and potatoes of our of my lecture this week in week number four. Uh, it's the solutions. I just go. It's the um, it's week four in class review. Uh, it, you'll see it in your in the when I post it after this lecture today. And again, the first tab is the review of our last weekend update video where I defined the cost, the weighted average cost of capital. Here's that slide again that I talked about. And the last video I gave you, this will help you in case number two and, and interpret and understand case number two. It's the definition of the weighted average cost of capital. What is the cost of capital? Then we begin our discussion this week. The next two weeks, we're going to be talking about capital budgeting. The capital budgeting process is an investment in an asset with an accountable depreciable life where you determine the net income 
by the revenues and expenses generated off that investment, where you determine the net cash flow, which includes net income, plus or minus depreciation, working capital, and disposable or salvage value. Then you do a return analysis, net present value, internal rate of return, profitability index, payback. These are all return analysis. And then finally, a risk analysis. This is mainly our discussion next week in week five, the scenario and the sensitivity capital budget analysis to determine the risk associated with your projections of capital budget. These will be spending the next two weeks on. Case number three involves calculating uh, the, the um, capital budgeting process, and we'll look at a template in just a minute on that example. Case uh, number, your, your uh, case assessment case or uh, class course assessment case is also involved around this. It's called the Electrics Incorporated. This will be posted with my Friday video this week. This is not due until March 27th, but it encompasses all this work and then a paper format to explain what you determined. That's the course assessment case, and that'll be posted later on this week, due the last Sunday of class. More on that later. But this is the process, what we're talking about in the next two weeks, capital budgeting, the investment in an asset, how to determine its return, and is the return warrants the investment in the asset. That's our discussion over the next two weeks and how to calculate that, how to interpret it, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at our example this week in a specific case. And this case involves around determining, first of all, as this, as the, um, as this capital budgeting process says, we, have an, we want to invest in an asset. What's its depreciable life? What's its net income and so on? But before we do anything about that, we have to determine, like you're determining in case number two this week, what is the cost of capital of this company? And remember, as we discussed in our weekend, weekend update last week, the cost of capital is the relationship of the risk in the market to this company's debt and equity positions, in re, and also weighted by the capital structure of the company, what percent of the company is in debt, what percent of the company is in equity. That capital structure drives the net or the weighted cost of capital. So here we have an example here where we have a debt to asset position of 60% in this company. In other words, debt is 60%. That means equity must be 40%. It's got a total 100. The tax rate of this company is 30%. The interest rate on their debt is 9%. The risk-free rate of the market in this example is 1.75. The market rate of return is 8%. And this company's specific beta is 1.25. Well, knowing the uh, how to calculate now, and you're working on that in case number two, the cost of capital, weighted average cost of capital, what is the cost of debt after taxes? Well, the cost of debt after taxes equals the interest rate on the debt, which is 9%, 0 0.09, times one minus the tax rate, which is 30% or 0.3. Our, our after tax cost of debt, is 6.3%. In other words, you take one minus the tax rate, 30%, so it's 70% of 9%, which is 6.3%. That 6.3 is weighted to the 60% debt position of the company and its capital structure, and we get 3.78% weighted average cost of after-tax debt weighted by the position in the capital structure of the company's debt position. The cost of equity or the expected rate of return on investors' capital, the capital asset pricing model, takes the risk-free rate, 0 0.0175, plus the market premium, which is the market rate of return, 0 0.09, minus the risk-free rate, 0 0.0175, and that's going to be multiplied times the beta of the company, 1.25. And we get 10.81%. The risk-free rate plus the market premium, which is the market rate of return minus the risk-free rate, 
times the beta of the company, we get 10.81% as the required rate of return in the market today of equity for this company. We put 10.81% in our weighted calculation, taking 40% of that, we get 4.32% weighted average cost of equity, weighted to the equity position of the company. Thus, the total 8.10% is our weighted average cost of capital. At this moment in time, it's costing us a little bit over 8% based on the risk in the market of debt and equity, based on our capital structure of our business currently, it's costing us a little bit over 8% to acquire capital. And where are we gonna put that capital? Well, now we get to the capital budget analysis. And I'm sure many of you have seen this before. If you've taken Business 330 as an undergraduate, if you've taken Business 500D as a graduate, this is business finance capital budgeting analysis. You've done this before. This, now you're gonna be doing it again. If you haven't done this before, this is why I'm supplying the template to help you explain it. This is, this is the capital budget analysis of an investment of $1 million. And is that million dollar investment today, year zero, going to pay us back and give us a return over the 10 year depreciable life of this asset? In other words, this $1 million piece of equipment that's gonna generate these revenues and expenses is has a depreciable life of 10 years. So that's its financial life. And that's how long the analysis goes for, 10 years. That $1 million asset is going to cost us to get the million dollars. There's our weighted average cost of capital that we just calculated, 8.1%. That's gonna be our discount rate. That's going to be our hurdle rate when we determine the discounted cash flow of this analysis. But before we do that, we have to calculate the net cash flow generated off this investment of $1 million into the future of 10 years. And we're given a variety of different figures that we have to place into this. Sales, expenses, working capital, depreciation, all kinds of information that we have to use to project out net operating cash flow. So first of all, what's our investment? Well, we're spending a million dollars. So I type in a million dollars in year zero. That's our investment today. What type of uh, revenue are we going to be generating off this? What's gonna be our sales? Well, our sales, we're expecting to sell 25,000 units a year over the next 10 years, all right? At a selling price of $20 per unit. So we're selling the product that this $1 million investment produces. We're, we anticipate and we budget 25,000 units. Now, where does that 25,000 units come from? Well, it comes from our production people, comes from our sales people, comes from our marketing people. This is what we think in the market, we can sell 25,000 of these units at 20 bucks over the next 10 years. And notice the next important number, the inflation rate. Annual change in sale price after year one is 2.5%. So we anticipate that the selling price after year one will increase by two and a half percent a year to cover inflation in this analysis. So let's go to year one. Let's type in the formula equals units 25,000 times the selling price of $20 a unit and we get $500,000, okay, that makes sense, 500,000, all right, that's, that's, our, that's our revenue anticipated for the first year. Now in year, whoop, I put that in the wrong place, sorry guys, you should have yelled at me. Let's go up here to sales, let's do that again. Equals 25,000 units times $20 a unit, there we go, there we go, that, that's there, that makes sense now. So now as you can see, we have $500,000 the first year. But notice what happens. I set up in this template. Notice the formula in year two. It's taking year one and it's multiplying it by 1.025. 1.025. What does that represent? 2.5% inflation. 2.5% is 0 0.025. So we add 0 0.025 to one 
and that's including the inflation growth every year through year 10. So we're still gonna sell 25,000 units. We're still gonna sell them at $20 a unit, but we're going to inflate that at a 2.5% inflation rate over the next 10 years. And we're gonna generate $5.6 million of anticipated sales off this project. And notice this template begins to fill in some numbers as we move along. Our expenses, let's take a look at our expenses. Variable costs. In this analysis, expenses are put into two, three classifications. Variable costs, costs that stay the same per unit, but vary with the amount of output of unit is being produced. Fixed costs, which is the direct opposite. Fixed costs are the fixed whole dollar amount every year, but on a per unit basis, they might change depending on the output, fixed costs and depreciation. Well, the variable cost information is given to this problem at $8 per unit with an inflation rate of 2% a year. So if I type in a formula here, taking the 25,000 units produced each year times $8 variable cost per unit, I get $200,000. And notice my preset template increases that by 2% every year. So about $2.2 million of variable expenses generated that it's gonna to need to be spent to generate the revenue for this product. Fixed cost, it's not a per unit, but fixed costs are a flat $50,000 a year. So we'll put $50,000 here. But notice the inflation rate for fixed costs are 1% a year then there's the 1% increase every year through year 10. Why dif different inflation rate? Well, they're different costs, different objectives. And that's where the inflation rate comes into. Where do you get these numbers? From your production people, from your marketing people. Again, other whole facets of companies go into these inputs of these numbers. You as the financial manager put them together into this capital budget analysis. Depreciation. Well, this, this is a $1 million investment with a depreciable life of 10 years. So if I take $1 million and divide it by 10 years, that's a depreciation rate, depreciation of $100,000 a year. So there's my depreciation expense every year. And that does not inflate. It's the same every year. And notice I fully depreciate it. $1 million expense over the <coughs> 10 years. So now I've calculated with these input numbers, my revenues, my operating expenses, and now I have my earnings before taxes. I take my revenue minus expenses and I get earnings before tax. See the formula right there. Then I take my tax rate 30%, 30% times my earnings before taxes, and I subtract that tax and I get my net income for every year. This is projected net accounting income, revenues minus expenses, including taxes. And I'm generating about $1.3 million of net income off this $1 million investment. And so far that looks pretty good. I'm spending a million dollars. I'm generating $1.3 million in net accounting income. But that's not the number I want in this analysis. I want the net cash flow to be generated off this investment. And to get the net cash flow, I have to do a couple additional things. First of all, I have to take into account what we anticipate receiving at the end of the depreciable life of this $1 million investment, the salvage value, the disposal value. It's estimated that this will be able to be disposed of, sold, sold off as scrap, whatever for $50,000 in year 10. But remember, I'm fully depreciating this asset over time. So at the end of its depreciable life, this asset will have a zero book value. I spent a million dollars as the asset and I depreciated the asset over time by a million dollars. So if there's zero, zero book value at the end of its life, Got to remember back to our accounting days about that. 
Well, if I'm receiving $50,000 in year 10 after we fully depreciated the asset, that's a capital gain of which I'll have to pay tax on that capital gain. So I need to put in a formula in year 10 for the salvage value equals the salvage value, $50,000 times one minus the tax rate of 30%. I got to take my tax out of that capital gain, which is 30%. And I get $35,000 as net cash received after tax of the disposable gain anticipated. Remember, this is a budget. It's what we think is going to happen at the end of its depreciable life. So I de determine the salvage value after tax in year 10. I don't do it until the end of the life of this asset. Then I add back in depreciation. I add back in depreciation to net income. Why? Depreciation is a non-cash expense. I'm not writing any checks here. It's an accounting entry. So really my net income is a little bit higher because of depreciation. So I'm adding depreciation back. Now, the last number here is called, or the last line is called net operating working capital. If any of you, and I'm sure all of you at some time or other have had an automobile. Well, when you buy a, new, a car, be it used, brand new or whatever, when you buy a car, is the, after you spend the money or borrow the money to buy the car, is that the end of the expenses associated with that car? No. You buy the asset, but still there's other expenses to operate and manage that car. Insurance, maintenance, registration, all that sort of thing. So once you purchase the asset, that's fine. But at the same time, you have additional costs associated with that asset. And that's the definition of working capital. When I, we purchase this $1 million inv investment, we anticipate additional costs to be maintained by that asset over the depreciable life. These additional costs not associated with expenses is called working capital. The definition of working capital is net operating assets less net operating liabilities. What's net operating assets? Receivables, inventory. What's net operating liabilities? Accounts payable, accruals. So you're gonna have other cash associated with this asset, not only with the other revenue and expense, other expenses of it. And you come up with a, you have to determine a rate of working capital. Right here, this line here, working capital as a percent of next year's sales, 12%. In other words, some internal auditor or cost accountant or CPA of this business has determined, and this rate always has to be given to you. This is not, you're not getting a doctorate in accounting to come up with this calculation. Somebody's gonna give you this percentage. And the percentage is that based on the next year's sales, 12% of that sales base or that revenue base is going to be your working capital. So look what I do in year zero. Today, in addition to the million dollars, I gotta take 12% of my first year sales, 500,000, and that's $60,000. Note, 12% of year one sales. That's $60,000 of additional cash flow that I have to spend to get this asset up and running today. So notice my total cash investment in this asset is $1,060,000 based on the investment in the asset and then the working capital needed to get that investment or asset going. But notice, remember the co combination of the working capital as a percent of next year's sales. Well, notice in year two, my sales are $512,500. They increased by the inflation rate. So if I need to maintain 12% as a base of sales, I need to take 12% of the difference. So notice this formula here. It takes the difference of year two to year one, $512,500 minus 500. That's $12,500. That's sales have gone up over these two years. 
and I take 12% of that 12,500 and I get $1,500 additional cash required for working capital in year one. Notice the total, this is working capital. So it accumulates. Now I have $61,500 accumulated working capital after year one, which just so happens to be 12% of year two sales. So every year subsequent, I take the delta between the next year's revenue and this year's revenue, take that delta, take 12% of it, and that's additional cash flow, working capital going out. Notice it's a negative, going out. And then in year 10, the last financial year of this project, this investment, there's no year 11 sales. So now all this accumulated working capital, the project is over. The investment is over. It's over, done, 10 years. So now I add all this money back as positive cash flow in year 10. And how do I get this number? Well, you can just go ahead and add all this up, or you can just take 12% of year 10 sales, like I did here, 12% of year 10 sales is 74,932. If I take my accumulated working capital going out and then coming back in, that should total zero. It's a net, it's a wash over the life of the asset. If you did your working capital calculation correctly, this should equal zero. If it doesn't, something was amiss. So notice what I've just done. I've now determined my net accounting income. I've now determined my net project cash flow, $2.4 million of cash being generated off this investment of $1,060,000. Well, now, now that I've calculated my cash flow budget, what is my return analysis? Going back here, I've just determined my net income. I've just determined my net cash flow. What is my return? What is my return in dollars, percent, ratio, years? The same project, looking at the return in four different disciplines. My return in dollars, it's called the net present value. What I need to do is take my accumulated earnings over 10 years and discount them back to year zero at my cost of capital, 8.1%. And I'll show you that calculation here. Formula, function, net present value. The rate is 8.1%. That's my weighted average that we calculated earlier. And the values are year one net cash flow to year 10. F21 to O21, it's now taking all that accumulated cash flow and discounting it back at 8.1%. And there it is. And let's round that to the nearest whole dollar. 1,564,799. So this, re this accumulated $2.4 million of net project cash flow discounted back at my cost of capital, 8.1%, has a discounted value today in year zero when I'm making the investment of 1,564,799. So my net present value is the difference between the two, the discounted cash flow and the investment, 504,799. That's a good thing. That's a real good thing. We're making in today's dollars over a half a million dollars more off our investment in dollars. In percentage, that's called the internal rate of return analysis, which is this cash flow over 10 years in a percent. What is the growth annually in percent? Formula, 
function, financial, internal rate of return, IRR. And all we do is under values, paint from year zero to year 10. We include year zero, the investment year. What is that return? What is this positive cash flow in relationship to the negative cash going out in year zero? 17.03%. And that's our return in percentage. Return in dollars is a little bit over 500,000. Return in percent is a little bit over 17%. Which you know, that's a good thing because our cost of capital was 8% and we're doubling the return over the cost. That's a good thing too. The profitability index, let's type that here. Profitability index. That's a ratio, the ratio of discounted cash flow to the investment. So in ratio, it's discounted cash flow divided by the investment. And let's put that as a negative to change that negative to a positive. And we get 1.48. In other words, we're earning $1.48 to every $1 in return off our investment. It's a ratio. Discounted cash flow to the investment 1.48 times greater than the investment. And then let's look at, let me clear this out to show you how I did this. Then let's look out the return in analysis. How long did it take us to get back the million 60 in our cash flow? All right. So we're starting off in year zero spending a million sixty thousand dollars. Then in year one, we generated a positive cash flow of two hundred three thousand five hundred dollars. That means we have eight fifty six five left to repay of the investment. In the next year, we take that eight sixty fifty six five and add to it year two's cash flow. And that's what we have left. So now that we got that formula set, let's just group that down the road a little bit. And notice by the times it gets to year five, we've broken even. We've paid back the million sixty thousand dollars because we have at the end of year five a positive fourteen thousand seven thirty of cash being received in addition to what we paid out. One, two, three, four. Point nine, four years. One, two, three, four, point nine, four years. Where'd you get the point nine, four? At the end of year four, I still had $211,987 to pay back. What percentage of that to year five's cash flow? It's 94%. So it took me 94% of year five to pay it back to zero. 4.94 years payback in years. So now I've determined the return analysis for this investment of million dollars, looking at the variables, looking at the weighted average cost of capital, taking all these variables and determining that this project is pretty good. I'm making over a half a million dollars in, in dollar return, 17% in percent return, a ratio of 1.48, anything over one is good. And I'm paying it back in less than half the time. Pretty good. This ladies and gentlemen is capital budget analysis. So what I, what we're going to be talking about on Friday is going the next step further. And this is our discussion for next week. The next tab here is risk analysis, a scenario and sensitivity analysis. What is the risk associated with this investment? And this is the subject of my weekend update video at the end of the week. And also next week's week five subject, because you're going to be doing all this analysis in case number three to be posted next weekend.
So take a look at these numbers, use this template if you want to, make a copy of this tab and blank it out and see if you can put it together yourself and come up with the formulas, what I did, and see if you come up with the same information. Matter of fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'm gonna, when I save this file folder, I'm gonna make a copy of this and blank it out. So you can go ahead and do it from blank and see if you can compare it to my information. So if you wanna practice that. So that's our lecture video for this week, number four. We'll see you again at the end of the week and I'll see you on Thursday in our review session if you wanna stop by and talk about case number two. Thanks everybody, have a great week. Isn't this fun? Adios.